Bonjour everyone, welcome to another Diecast Showcase. Welcome to the channel it's, if it's your first time visiting. And welcome back if uh, you are a return viewer, which is much appreciated. Uh, today, um, I decided to um, uh, show you my top 10 um, 143 scale loose cars. And uh, by going through uh, the items I want to show you today, I noticed that uh, the selection that, um, you know, ended up being uh, the ones that I'm going to show you today are definitely um, themed uh, unwillingly um, within a range of model years for these cars between late 80s and early 2000s, very late 80s to very early 2000s actually. Um, which was not necessarily intended on the get-go, but hey, it ended up like that. So uh, we're going to have a variety of different uh, die-cast manufacturers, uh, as well as a variety of different vehicles uh, from different countries of origin, um, different uh, uh, auto manufacturers as well, um, and, you know, uh, I'd say a span of about 15 years from the oldest to the newest model. Uh, if we're talking about the actual model year of the one for one of these vehicles. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. And uh, we're going to start with uh, a few German cars. So a couple German cars. So first one that I will show you today is this very, very nice Audi RS4 Avant B5 generation. Um, this is a model by Mini Champs. Um, brand that needs no introduction. They've been in the diecast game for decades upon decades now. So high quality stuff. Um, and I particularly appreciate their 143 scale models as the vast majority of them actually roll and roll quite well so uh, let's check this one out a little bit closer so um, basically we're talking about uh, one of my favorite wagons of all time and uh, my second favorite Audi of all time right after the RS2 the the original super estate or super wagon or however you'd like to call it basically at least in my opinion it's pretty much the first that really Put a scare on most exotics of the same uh, era. This specific RS4 uh, was powered by a twin turbo 2.7 liter V6. Um, we did not get the RS4 trim in North America. We did get the S4, which pushes out a respect well uh, for the for the era push out, push out a respectable uh, 265 horsepower and. Uh, Made uh, made it with a, quite a harmonic sound from that uh, that that powertrain. Um, in RS4 trim, we're upping the ante quite a lot. These put out 380 horsepower in. Uh, these came out mid '99 as a 2000 model. So for the year 2000, 380 horsepower. Just to give you a perspective, um, in uh, the year 2000, a Porsche 911 Turbo, so 996 generation, uh, as standard was pushing out 420 horsepower. So this all-wheel drive wagon that is, you know, quite, uh, quite, you know, mundane looking, uh, especially to the untrained eye, uh, we're talking about a car that pushed out 40 horsepower less than a Porsche 911 Turbo. These are all-wheel drive, came exclusively with a six-speed manual gearbox as opposed to the S4 that was available with a five-speed uh, Tiptronic. Um, what makes it different besides the engine horsepower output versus an S4? Well, first and foremost, you've got the front bumper. Front bumper, uh, which has larger front vents and uh, cooling ducts that you can see right above my finger here just before the front wheel arches. 
Um, as in the S4 as well, we do have, um, you'll notice the mirrors are silver. That's because they are brushed aluminum finish on the real car. So that was replicated by many champs here. Uh, besides that, we're talking about a question of badging. Obviously, the R, the the S4 Avant was available very in very limited production uh, for North America, actually specifically the U.S. It was not available in Canada, and uh, most of them were Tiptronic uh, RS4s. Basically, we never got. Uh, they were not available in sedan form, except for a few. Um, I believe a couple of, of of ones produced directly by Audi. Um, which they uh, named the S uh, RS4 limousine in Germany. But yeah, not really something that uh, you'd be able to find. Uh, a lot of people do the RS4 conversions if we're talking about the body. Obviously, these cars are have uh, a lot of history in the tuning world. I'm going on a little bit longer about this one because really it is one of my favorite all-time cars. Uh, I love wagons. Um, I love the fact that it's manual only. It's now my favorite color. I would have preferred probably Dolphin Gray or even Negaro Blue, but it nonetheless is a very interesting and very good looking vehicle in my opinion. All right, next up, um, the other German car that I'm going to include in this little showcase today is another Mini Champs. Um, and uh, I made an allusion to uh, the Porsche 996 Turbo. Well, definitely not my favorite generation of 911, as this one more more probably is. So Mini Champs, Mini Champs 911 GT, which is what they call it. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you the base on this Mini Champs. Uh, just taking a little pause from that Porsche. So here's your base, Audi RS4, 143 scale, with the Mini Champs logo on the top. And um, yeah, you can see that uh, it's got some uh, exhaust detail on the stock exhaust, which most of these don't have anymore, because let's just say if uh, you consult the equivalent of Auto Trader for Europe, I normally look at Auto Scout 24. Um, I mean, the the some of these uh, are modified to seven, eight hundred horsepower plus. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely hard to find in a stock form. So, but getting back to this nice Porsche here, so they call it nine eleven GT. I'll show you the base right away. Um, is that it? Nine eleven G? No, nine eleven RS. So sorry, nine eleven RS. Um, so I'm not sure if this specific one would be a RS 3.8 or the RS 3.6. Uh, let's assume that it's RS 3.6. Uh, so as you can see, it's got a uh, uh, kind of like a uh, ox blood colored uh, interior. Um, you've got the three piece wheels with the centers color coded to the body color in white, gloss white. Um, you've got the high rise wing. Trying to be extra careful not to drop this. These are quite expensive, so yeah. So Carrera RS, you can see the detailing is impeccable. I do prefer these with the low rise wing, uh, or even duck bill. Duck bill is definitely not something that's standard and more of a conversion. Uh, but uh, the turbo style wing was available on these uh, as opposed to the high rise. So I find it's a little bit, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's my personal taste, but I like a little bit more of, more of a sobriety on the uh, look of cars. Um, yeah, so Porsche logo, as you can see, uh, the front air dam is specific to the RS model and can also be found on the, uh, the GT2. Uh, this is basically a naturally aspirated version of the 993 GT2, you know, also known as the Widowmaker. Uh, it does ha not have the riveted um, um, fender flares uh, and obviously lacks the twin turbochargers on the engine. But uh, yeah, this is pretty much my favorite generation of Porsche. Last of the air cooled. Um, 
it's almost like SQL with the uh, 964, which I also love. It's the two generations I grew up with. Uh, if we're talking about uh, um, my gaining considerable knowledge of cars and, and, and learning to appreciate the different uh, variances of uh, within the same model range. Um, but this is definitely an example of, to me, a dream Porsche. So dream Porsche for sure. Um, yeah, it's really nice, uh, especially uh, with all the little mini champs touches. You know, look at those wheels, super well replicated. You can see the uh, uh, slot, uh, slotted and drilled uh, discs behind the, those wheels. They do turn with the wheels, so it's a little bit unfortunate. But uh, yeah, these are really, I mean, it's perfectly proportioned. Would have loved the rear uh, lens uh, light bar. They decided to go painted with this one. But I will definitely not complain about that. These are hard to find. Um, and they will run you a premium online these days as opposed to when I purchased this off eBay maybe 12 years, 15 years ago. Uh, at which point, uh, you know, it wasn't that bad. All right. So next up, I will show you... Uh, a couple of Japanese cars you know what before we get into the you know the kind of like dream car type of thing I'm actually gonna take a moment to show you a 143 scale that I've included in here because I almost consider it an error even though it's clearly not and it's just a lack of uh, research I guess but what I have for you next is a Nissan product. No surprise there, as some of you will already know, I love Nissan. Uh, but this is a Nissan product uh, under the In Infinity banner. So this one is an Infinity Q45. So the Infinity Q45 is the flat was the flagship of Infinity. Uh, this specific generation was released in 2002 um, and it would be the third generation Q35 the original being released in 91 and the facelifted version being released in 96 for a complete model change in 2002 um, cool point uh, that were or, or detail this was one of the first vehicles to have uh, projector lights now I know that they're replicated but it's extremely small but if you look on the right side inside the mirror you'll see that uh, there's a large circular uh, and detailed lens now uh, we can see it a little bit better here see how it looks like almost like a barrel of um, a revolver with the six bullets in the chambers well, this basically was a xenon, xenon headlight, uh, and these were the most powerful projector lights on an o, uh, OEM projector lights uh, at the time of release, and it made a really cool effect at night when they opened. Uh, now, reason why I almost want to say this is a comic relief type of car, look at the spelling of infinity on that front plane. People, infinity, there's four I's. There is not three I's and a Y. You know, I don't want to be a spelling police, but a lot of people spell infinity as in to infinity and beyond. Pretty sure Buzz Lightyear does not drive one of these, so infinity with an I at the end, please, people. Um, yes, the unfortunateness continues on the back much on the car via the plate as with that slightly oversized badge and misspelled badge below the driver's side taillight. Uh, the Q45 though, the badge is actually well proportioned and well done. Uh, so this is a car from J Collection, a company that does make, as you probably guessed, JDM cars. They have a really cool lineup, these big executive sedans, uh, it has vans, com um, compact cars, a few sport cars as well. Uh, I'm not sure if they still produce new stuff as of today, but I know that uh, as of a 
couple years back, they were still doing, they were still doing these, uh, they were still doing these models in this range. So, uh, very cool. Uh, black with a tan interior. It's very light tan. It also it almost looks gray, but you know, you have wood grain in there. You have a really, really well rendered interior. Uh, and this was just before Infinity started their big infotainment screen. Literally a year before. I actually personally have a uh, Infinity M45, a 2003. So literally this would be a 7 series, a BMW example. And my M45 is the equivalent of a 5 series. So slightly smaller, slightly sportier, but same engine. The uh, um, uh, VH45D. 4.5 liter V8, 345 horsepower, 333 pounds of torque, uh, automatic five speed rear wheel drive. Uh, surprising touch on this one, and definitely a sign that uh, this is not an infinity. Absence of sunroof. These were standard with these came standard with a sunroof. We're talking about an eighty thousand dollar car uh, in uh, the early two thousands. Definitely came standard with a a, a tilt and uh, sliding uh, glass sunroof. Uh, however, the Japanese version, which was the Nissan SEMA, did not come standard with a sunroof, could even be ordered with a cloth interior. So, a little bit of history on that car, but hey, it's pretty funny that they misspelled Infinity all over the place for a flagship Nissan vehicle. Um, speaking of flagships, but in a whole other Nissan realm, uh... Probably my favorite 143rd scale model in my collection. The infamous Nissan Skyline R32 GTR. So B&R32. Um, 1989. Uh, first year release model. Um, what can I say? RB26 DTT. All wheel drive. All wheel steering. 5-speed manual, twin turbo, inline 6, um, decimated all competition in uh, the uh, race, uh, race events it participated in. It was outbanned, namely in Australia, in the ATCC, Amer uh, Australian Touring Car Championship, because uh, literally it was unbeatable. This specific model is by Kyosho. I'm going to show you all the new little manual turntable type of thing here. So you can see all the details. But I love this car. These are some of my favorite OEM rims. Uh, they're 16 by 8. Um, plus 30 offset. Um, and they look good on everything. And fit on mostly everything. Since they've got a bolt pattern of 5 by 114.3. Or for... Uh, Use guys uh, that uh, calculate in inches. That would be five bolt uh, by four point five inch uh, uh, pattern. So, um, yeah, really cool, really cool. Completely stock. Look at that tiny exhaust tip, tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, it's perfect, literally. I mean, I got none to say about this model. I mean, you can see that the brakes are there behind those stock wheels. Again, I believe, uh, oh, no, these ones actually, you know what? They do not turn with the wheel. And look at that. You can actually see the caliper behind. Really, really well done. Everything is there. The little Skyline GT badge on the, on the front fender. Super tiny, but it's there. And it's perfectly proportioned. Now, obviously, a right-hand drive vehicle. Black interior, so there's not a whole lot to see. Most Japanese coupes and coupes do have a rear wiper, as you can see here. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Very JDM-ish. Uh, rear badging is impeccable as well. You got the Nissan, the Skyline, the GTR. You've got the, well, obviously, you know, the license plate as well, but I won't really uh, count that as anything uh, super incredible. Those quad rear round lights. I mean, literally, this thing is beautiful. Beautiful. And you got a little Skyline badge on the front. So, very, very nicely done. You got a little bit of detail on the bottom. 
not a whole lot in terms of vehicle information. I mean, literally, the only thing you've got is some tiny, 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 tiny text that you can probably not see. Yeah, there you go. Literally, it's tiny. Actually, it's so tiny, it's upside down. So there you go. Not a whole lot to see, but from what I can make out, this was crafted in China. So, there you go. Yeah, awesome. Very, very well done. Good job, Kyosho. All right, next up, last Japanese, uh, yeah, last Japanese car I'm going to show you today. We are going to be looking at a nice auto art product. We have this auto art Mitsubishi Pajero Evo. Now this is one of two that I actually have. This is the auto art version, so I'm going to say it's more upper scale than the other one I have, which is by Car Kararama and it's part of a set. I'll show you that one in an alternate video, for sure, eventually down the road. Now this one here um, actually has a cool, a uh, couple cool features. First and foremost, uh, you know what, let's start with the base. Really cool detailing throughout the truck. These things are so cool. These are actually homologation specials uh, for the Paris Dakar rally. Um, and they were produced in a limited number, but not as limited as some other hom homologation specials. These ones were turbocharged, all wheel drive, manual. Uh, put out the gentleman agreed 280 horsepower, just like the uh, GTR we checked out just before. Uh, you got all kinds of hood vents and all kinds of stuff here. A lot of uh, a lot of little Evo touches as well. You can see the evolution uh, markings on the front bumper. You know, auto art obviously means you're gonna get a host of details. I mean, you've even got some little uh, lensed fog lights right here. Right above my finger. Nice skid plate. Um, the red mud flaps. You've actually got also, oh, yeah, a removable rear, rear uh, spare tire, which is kind of cool. But you've also got steerable front wheels. Uh, yeah, exactly, front wheels, which is really cool. This guy actually even has a little bit of suspension, just a tiny bit of suspension, which is cool. I mean, it's not like I'm gonna put this on a track or something, but this is this thing is super nice. It's probably one of my favorite JDM SUVs that we never got here. I'm not a big JDM, oh, I'm not a big SUV guy. I'm a big JDM guy, but I'm not a big SUV guy, but this is the kind of SUV that I love. Give me a real truck. Don't give me a front wheel drive you know, Nissan Qashqai or Kicks or whatever. This is what I'm talking about. A truck that's made to be used and abused, that's going to do it in style, in aggressive style. And, you know, this one also happens to be fast. So what's not to love? This is really cool. Really in limited production. Actually, these are, uh, these are um, eligible for import now. So I don't know if I should or should not say that. But uh, yeah, available for import. Uh, these started in 96, so uh, they're probably going to be, uh, you know, a nice alternate to uh, the star cars that are so overhyped and overpriced now, such as the R33 GTR. R32 GTRs are almost unattainable now, and, uh, you know. All right, next up, uh, my one and only car from the UK that I'm going to show you in this scale um we are talking about a car from the brand vitesse and we are talking about a very nice aston martin db7 gt so the db7 gt was kind of like final run type of top spec db7 so v12 six liter uh available either in manual or automatic uh it also came with gt specific wheels that are very well replicated in this case uh 
um, sportier five spokes versus the standard multi spokes um, that uh, you got on the, Von the Vantage V12 uh, version. Um, and these were only made in coupe, not in convertible. Uh, you know, black uh, black housing t uh, headlights. Um, you know, this one's very well made. This is actually more budget friendly than the the first few I showed you before. Just to give you an idea, um, the J Collections um, Infinity with a Y there. That'll these these uh, kind of vehicles will run you between twenty and thirty dollars before shipping. Um, Auto Art, I mean, very variable. But um, I'm going to guesstimate at this point in time, you're probably looking at something like $40 to $50. Uh, Mini Champs, probably around the same price uh, range. And the Kyosho, maybe slightly less. This Vitesse, basically, is probably going to run you... Uh, you can probably find it on eBay for under 20 bucks before shipping. So, I mean, not not that bad. Not that bad. I mean, for the uh, the quality of model you get, I mean... Rubber tires, correct wheels. This one does not have brake discs, unfortunately. Uh, but I mean, you know, lensed front and rear lights, uh, very nice detailing. Um, and this this particular car, I mean, I love the style. These I fell in love with this um, with the styling of this car uh, when it came out. Uh, it came out, I believe, in '94 as a '95 model. At that time, it was a, an inline six supercharged engine, Jaguar sourced, since this car was produced under the uh, ownership of Ford. Um, yeah, and it had a nice uh, 10 year, almost 10 year career. It was this, this one is the, the GT like this was discontinued in 2003. And as mentioned, it's pretty much last of the line. Um, I do like that, this nice metallic Bordeaux red got a tiny bit of almost golden orange flake in it too which is actually very close to one of the few colors that this was offered in uh, as opposed to the regular v, uh, db7 vantage uh, the, the vantages did have quite the extensive catalog of colors these were limited to just a few you had dark uh, you had a medium blue uh, obviously dark green uh, this kind of like um, red metallic you had black I think that's pretty much it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you know, I I could be wrong there, but uh, yeah. All right, moving along. Next car I'm going to show you is a little bit of an oddity. Um, this is actually also a Mini Champs. Um, and it is my the only American car I'm going to show you. Now I have a few other favorites in the American cars, but they're they're you know I mean. We're talking about cars from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, typically, what you'd expect when you think, the first thing you'd think of when you think American car. This, however, is something completely different. So, this is a Panaz Esperante GT1R. So, and this is a street version. This is actually a car that ran in Le Mans in the early to mid 2000s. Uh, and this is the street trim car. I do not think it was actually offered to the public. I think it was more than a, of a prototype than anything else. But this thing is just hella bad. Uh, I mean, bad to the bone. I love this car. It's so aggressive. Look at the length of the hood versus the rest of the car. I'm, I mean, we're talking about almost like, what, a 50-50 split here. Um front clip uh, versus the rest of the length of the car. Uh, you've got some really nice gold split rims. You know, all is BBS LM, but they seem to be one piece, so I'm not sure if they actually would be. You've got that Panos logo on the front fender. There you go. Um, side exit exhaust, which I'm assuming must sound completely insane. Um, and look at the rear. No rear window. Really nice, um, uh, really nice, um, uh, lower, uh, lower valence. 
lens uh, lights throughout tiny little mirrors with a really cool placement as well I love the rearview mirrors on the A-pillar directly it's, I find that really cool um, it's got Euro style li um, license plates and um, yeah it's just a really nice car overall it's it's so uh, aggressive it looks like a Batmobile to me at least um, the cool thing about this one as well is that it's metal on metal the base I mean it's fairly nondescript as you can see which I mean is not far off from the real car honestly I mean this this thing's on slicks uh, this one though however does not roll it it does roll but it does not roll very well um, but look at this I mean metal on metal it's super heavy um, yeah just a beast it's a beast of a car really really like this one and not many people know of it which is kind of cool um all right next up uh let's see which one are we gonna check out next you know what let's flip it to italian cars the last three cars i'm gonna show you out of my top 10 um you know young timer cars you know i'm going to go with um another car that's not very well known and that we did not get in north america we're talking about the Maserati Quattroporte. Uh, this would be, what is it, Quattroporte? Maybe the fourth gen of Quattroporte? Third or fourth gen? Not really sure exactly, as we did not get most of these. Um, this is the generation, actually, if you've seen the Godfather series, uh, quite the cinema, cinema classic. Um, they actually do use a Maserati Quattroporte of the generation just before this one. Um, the This specific generation came out in 94 and was produced until oh, 2001, maybe? Whereas the following generation that we actually got here in North America, and uh, it's quite a bargain, actually, on the used market if you have a solid budget for maintenance. Um, yeah, it came out in 2003, so, I mean, you had a, what, two-year hiatus, and uh, then, uh, yeah, we got the, uh, it's not the current generation, generation just before, so this is two generations back. Uh, this specific model is a 98, uh, and it's a 3.2 V8 Evolution, or Evolution, um, so this is a car that uh, had a twin-turbo 3.2 liter V8, that also powered the Maserati uh, 3200 GT, um, which was replaced by the Maserati Gran Turismo, uh, Gran Turismo and that we got as the 4200 GT here in North America. Um, so basically, uh, this specific model pushed out 370 horsepower, um, and there was a twin turbo V6 version as well with a 2.8 liter V6 that has quite the history going back uh, to the 80s. Uh, and that specific version put out 280 horsepower. So, um, yeah, very, uh, it's, this is a uh, Gandini design. Um, very nice, uh, very nice, a uh, stately car. Um, you know, politicians and uh, mafiosi alike love these. So, very uh, luxurious, still quite sporty, rear-wheel drive, available either in an automatic or a uh, manual in both trim, both engine trims. This is really accurate, though. It's even got the Italian license plates on there from the era, from the uh, late 90s. Badging is great. Uh, you can tell it's a V8 through the alloys that are bigger, as well as the quad exhaust on the back basically reference points there and you can tell it's an evo um the uh the lights and bumpers are different basically slightly different um but i mean this is straight out of the era basically of the you know that's that was kind of started with the uh, maserati uh, by turbo in the very early 80s 82 release date and this this family a car ended pretty much yeah early 2000s basically um, but yeah, very, very nice car. Uh, it's literally a four-door Ferrari. Um, 
beige, dark beige interior, which is really nice. You've got some wood grain in this one as well. I love these lux luxury sports sedans, basically. Um, yeah, and uh, this is by a company called Granny and Partners. This is my only car from these uh, this specific uh, diecast brand. Sorry, it's kind of hard to see the details on here. Um, the base is very, very... It's a very shiny plastic, but I think this is pretty much the best I'll be able to do. So there you go. Um, cool car, not super well known here. And again, uh, if you're in Canada, where we have for vehicle import rules, a 15-year rule for left-hand drive vehicles, uh, these have been eligible for import for about uh, four years now already. Uh, and even more if you go with a, a an earlier model. Um, now, basically, uh, the next one I'm going to show you is a car that is a pretty much the Italian equivalent of um, the uh, 993 uh, RS that uh, we see here behind us. Um, basic oh, behind us, sorry, in the back row. Um, so basically, 993 is my ultimate favorite Porsche from, you know, around the era where I first got my, my, my driver's license. Well, this is the Italian equivalent. The Ferrari F355 GTB or Berlinetta. Um, this specific one is especially, uh, um, especially, uh, luring to me in view of the fact that it's not red because I love a Ferrari, especially when it's not red. And I also the, like the fact that it's not Giallo fly, the, the very bright yellow example, uh, um, that, uh, if ever you watch Hoovy's Garage, his most recent uh, car sold was a F three five five Spider in Jallo Fly, um, and uh, Nicolas Cage in the movie The Rock uh, drove one as well that he crashed uh, in the well that he crashed in the movie, obviously for the movie. Um, so you know this one basically, I love the fact that it's a hard top, although I do like the GTS Spider not so much. Um, very, very accurately reproduced. The cool thing is you can actually tell which trim it is. So if you look inside, you will see that uh, you have that spherical uh, shift knob in uh, silver or brush aluminum on the real car, which indicate, indicates a uh, gated six-speed manual. Um, and you do notice as well that the rear filler panel that houses those four quad lights and the Ferrari logo is uh, color coded, which means it does not have the Fiorano package. So very nice job on this car. Uh, we're talking about uh, a very cool hue of gray, which I forget the name of the color. Um, I also love the fact that we've got a red interior. Uh, Cuore Rosso interior, which is great. Um, front end is very cool as well. I love the fact that we've got some clear, uh, some clear indicators on the front, which is uh, to me much more alluring than the uh, ambers that uh, the North American spec cars get. Uh, Ferrari logos are extremely well reproduced as well, and I believe this specific. One is from Altaya, which uh, my French viewers will know quite well as a brand as they still make cars to this day. Although this is quite an older one. Uh, I probably purchased this about a decade ago, I'd say, off eBay. For really, really stupid low price. Don't know how much this would be worth today. I'd have to do a price check to see exactly how much these are worth. But I think I paid something like $15 plus shipping. So probably 20 under $25 all in, which I mean, to me seems like an awful good price for this type of uh, quality. And again, I mean, oh, and uh, yeah, cool fact on this one. I mean, the windows are, 
Windows are closed on the passenger side, open on the driver's side so as to get a better view of the cockpit, which is something I find pretty cool. Uh, this is pretty much the last of the mid-engine V8 Ferraris that require engine out services uh, for the, uh, the, the belts and everything like that. Um, and they're the last, I think they're pretty much, yeah. The last of Ferrari, eh, I mean, they're I, for sure they're the last mid-engine V8 Ferrari with pop-up lights. Um, last overall Ferrari with pop-up lights? Uh, maybe the 456M would have been that. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, it's, 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 it's one of the last ones, basically. Um, and last but not least... Probably, um, well, actually, definitely my most interesting um, Italian 143 scale car. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Is this Leo Models Lamborghini Countach, 25th anniversary edition uh, in full race livery now honestly this car when i saw it on ebay i found it a little bit preposterous because honestly kuntash is not a good race car it's just not a good race car it's it's dynamically not a car made to race and ferruccio lamborghini always said he didn't really want to produce race cars because that's what ferrari was doing Enzo Ferrari didn't want to produce road cars. The road cars were only produced to actually finance the race team. And still to this day, that's the case. But Lamborghini, since the infamous feud that he and Enzo had, decided to produce better road cars than Lamborghini. Now we end up with a last of the line Countach in race livery. And I did a bit of research on this car back when I got it, back when I got this model. And this is an actual real livery. It was raced as is in Japan. And Japanese did race hypercars. I mean, there's there's many. They, they, they raced a lot of McLaren F1s in period and uh, all kinds of other, uh, you know, like Porsche 962s and all kinds of really crazy race cars. And this is one of them. So, I mean, it's funny to see a Lamborghini with Advan, um, Advan sponsorship instead of Pirelli. Um, also, the wing is specific to this race car. It is absolutely not a Ferrari wing, as you can tell. A Ferrari wing, sorry, a Lamborghini wing, as you can tell. Um, you know, it's really that biplane, adjustable wing, um... That actually helps aerodynamics. Uh, another fun fact here. The wing on a Countach, um, to most, uh, is like, it's got to be on the car because otherwise the car looks like it's missing something. I find it's the complete opposite. I prefer Countach without a wing because uh, I find the lines are much more pure and uh, reminiscent of the first edition uh, Countach in 1973. The Periscopo model. Uh, this though, um, the wing works, but uh, on this specific car. But the road car, when equipped with the ring wing, actually had a lower top speed than a car without. And the wing, uh, which was designed by Walter Wolf, uh, actually did not aid the car aerodynamically. If we're talking about grip or G forces. So it's really a showpiece more than anything else. It's a style element and absolutely not anything to do with function. It's purely form. Um, here's your profile. You've got also the uh, wheels. I mean, they're going to be hard to see. Let me try and get some detail for you on there. But these wheels... Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the Japanese wheel brand. 
I think they're called autostratas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they actually make wheels that look a lot like, example, the uh, old Porsche phone dial wheels that you had on early uh, 944s and 928s. Uh, they also make uh, wheels that are awfully reminiscent of, example, the wheels that you would have had on the Speedline wheels on Ferrari F40s or 288 GTOs. And I believe these wheels uh, are actually modeled after Autostrada wheels. If I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about this. They're definitely three-piece. Uh, Interior-wise, it's going to be very hard to see, but we have a full roll cage that you can get a, glint, a tiny glimpse of right here. Um, you know, single seat, uh, again, one window open, uh, and funnily enough, they had to remove the, um, it's only the middle part of, uh, it's only the lower part of the window that opens on these. Normally there's a bar right smack in the middle to allow only the lower part of the window to open, uh, for aerodynamics, basically, and wind noise, uh, at high speed with the windows open. And uh, also because of the lack of room because of this rear air vent that prevented the window from actually, if, if, if they didn't do it this way, basically your window when you put it completely down would be like halfway down, which kind of didn't make sense. So uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, really interesting vehicle. Um, I know that this video was slightly longer than usual. Um, but I find all these cars have so many interesting facts about them uh, that I really wanted to take the time to um, present them properly to you. Now, mind you, information I provide is always off the top of my head. There's not really any research done on the get-go to confirm facts before making these videos. So errors on my part are always possible. And I tend to always review the video before... Uh, uploading and if there's errors um, I hold myself accountable for them and I do leave them in there because I very rarely edit unless example I lack storage uh, phone dies or something like that and you know example I'm you know cracking castings open or some cracking packages open I can't really redo that so either way uh, hopefully uh, you enjoyed if you did uh, hit that like button uh, subscribe if uh, you want to be notified of future uploads on my behalf. And of course, please feel free to leave your feedback in the comments, which is always fun to read. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave you on that. Uh, I'll wish you an excellent rest of your day. And I'll see you on the next one. Cheers and goodbye.